Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Greetings, everyone. And welcome to True Wealth. I'm Dave Basconi, and here in the studio with me, as always, is Maria Smith. Maria, did you make it through the heat wave? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, we are so, so, so blessed, so many of us, um, with air conditioning. You know, we just, we don't realize how much of a blessing that is and how, for centuries, for millennia, people did not have that. Exactly. Exactly. I think we touched on that uh, a while back, or maybe last week, uh, that uh, air conditioning is a very recent convenience. Uh, You know, man has always had heat uh, from a fire, uh, so that was covered. But this convenience that we take for granted called air conditioning um, uh, is very recent. Matter of fact, uh, I think that's one of the reasons how Cancun got started. It was such a terrible, buggy, horrible place to be. And then with the advent of air conditioning, um, they've turned it into a resort. So, um, uh, you know, things technology does change things in a big way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, um, well, uh, I think our plan was to uh, pick up where we left off last, last week uh, we were, we had started talking about the gospel that dealt with the Good Samaritan, and uh, just so we can keep uh, continuity here, uh, we'll just take it from the top. And I have some notes, and so we'll just you know, start with that and then uh, finish the discussion. How's that? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Yeah, a couple of Sundays back uh, was the Gospel on the Good Samaritan, and um, our priest started his homily with a chilling statement, and that was that the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is the number one bridge in the country for suicide. And he then mentioned a story about a young man that took his life there, how later the authorities uh, found a neatly written note in this young man's apartment, and it was only two lines long, and it read like this, going to the bridge, if anyone smiles at me, I won't jump. And that lead-in um, had everybody's attention. And um, we all know the events that took place in the parable, um, how a man on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho fell victim to robbers that left him half dead. Uh, a priest and a Levite both see him but pass on the opposite side of the road. It was only when the Samaritan came by that he was shown compassion. He took the man to an inn and paid the innkeeper two silver coins for his care. And then when Jesus asked the person he was responding to, uh, this uh, parable was from a question by uh, someone that was trying to trap Jesus. Um, He said, uh, Jesus asked this person, which of the three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? And this person answered, the one who treated him with mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now, that's pretty much, I think, where we uh, kind of ended it. But um, I know you had some comments. Maybe you just want to say a couple of things, and then there's some other comments that our priest made that I would like to share. Okay, well, yeah, that's such such a profoundly sad story. And it is really just such a... Such a um, hardship that there are so many, so many tragedies like this, and um, it really is so heartbreaking that there's so much 
sadness, confusion, loneliness, so much disconnect. I think that's a key word, disconnect. You can be near lots of people. You can be in crowds, but there's a disconnect, an emotional inner disconnect. Inner disconnect, which is emotional or spiritual, and it's just what is so important. I mean, it just goes to show that it doesn't matter how much money you have, the job, the, none of that. Those things could be a factor. But really and truly, people who have a lot of money and who have um, a, a job, who have everything materially, those are just as likely to commit suicide. Yeah, we don't know much about this young man uh, that was uh, he referred to in the homily. Uh, you know, he just, it was just that a note was found. But he sounded uh, uh, like uh, someone that's very sad because all he needed was one smile from one person on his way there, and he would have changed his mind. He would have, he said he would not jump, um, and he didn't get it. Uh, that's a pretty sad statement about uh, you know our state of affairs, and um, yeah, the uh, the culture's uh, approach to happiness is sometimes very lacking for a lot of people because the culture doesn't fill a void that I think only, you know, the divine can fill. And I think that's where we really get off track and people buy into it and they find time after time that they're still lacking and finally maybe they just give up. Maybe that's when suicide starts to enter their mind uh, as the way out. That I've tried everything, just keeps getting worse. And um, why am I here, you know? Yeah. You know, th now that's definitely, those are good points, and there's a lot to say about that. But I'm just going to come from a different perspective. And the different perspective is, in our modern world, we really feel entitled to things. We feel entitled to everything, really, basically, to job, to money, to relationships, to a happy ever after um, commitment with somebody or a wonderful home life. or We feel entitled to not suffer. And loneliness is a suffering. Feeling disconnected, having people treat you badly, not having relationships work out. All these things are emotional, psychological, and spiritual sufferings. We don't want any suffering in this world, be it physical or be it emotional. We can't stand suffering. We can't stand not having, not having things go our own way. I mean, I think as a culture, as, a, as actually just as um, in our times, and it could be just not our country, but other countries too, modern countries, but especially America, because America is the greatest country. Right now, it is the greatest country. Will it always be? We don't know. The Roman Empire was the greatest for centuries. But right now, America is the greatest country in so many ways on the face of the earth. And as Americans, we feel like we can control our happiness. If we can have this, you know, we really think that Either medicine is going to help or self-help books, counseling therapy. All those things have a purpose. They can be good, but they're not the end-all and the be-all. They're not going to magically take away physical pain at all times, emotional pain, psychological pain, all those things. Really, basically, our lives is to learn how to love. And we know what the true essence of love is. It's wanting the, what is good for the other and it involves our own personal suffering. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, one of the other things um, that ties into what you're saying, uh, the, our father kept, uh, he, he talked a little more about it, and he pointed out something, and I just I wanted to ask if you were aware of this, because I was not. He said that when Jesus, in his parables, uh, used the road from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. That had great significance uh, to the people listening at the time. He said it was known to be an extremely dangerous road. And I think he said it was called, and I may be wrong on this, uh, but he said it was the blood road. 
and anyone traveling traveling it would be moving as fast as they could, which adds another insight to it as to what the Samaritan did for the victim. You know, he put his own safety at risk to help this man. Were you aware of uh, that this was not just another road, it was one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous, that had the nickname the Blood Road? Were you aware of that? I didn't know about the nickname. However, I've heard from my own um, pastor, he has said more than once, Jericho was known as the city of sin. So when you're leaving Jerusalem, which is the holy city, and going towards Jericho, it was a parable of going towards a, a bad place, a place of sin. Yeah, okay, yeah, that all fits. And one other thing he pointed out, and I thought this was significant, uh, he said, uh, showing mercy is not convenient. It's not efficient. It's not practical or cost-effective. Um, when the Good Samaritan stopped to help the victim, it was unplanned. It was not on his things to do list that day. Uh, stopping was inconvenient. It was inefficient. It was impractical and costly, both in time and money, and possibly his life. So yet that's what we must do when we show mercy. It, it's part of the package. And I thought, you know, I never thought of it in those terms before, that showing mercy does uh, uh, does require effort, and it may uh, cause you to have to change your schedule. It may cost you in some way. Uh, it uh, makes you less efficient in the during the day. Uh, but showing mercy uh, really does require a commitment, and uh, I thought that was a good point that he made with this particular homily. I, like I said, I've never quite heard it in that regard. Yeah. Um, what you're saying about showing mercy requires effort. And it can be all the things that you said. It can be uh, the money. It can be the convenience, the energy, the time. But, you know, it can also be something internal, something interior. It costs effort to show mercy to somebody who's done wrong to you or who continues to do wrong to you. It shows, it, it requires a great deal of inner strength, inner you could even say inner inconvenience because you're taking away what would be most comfortable comfortable to you, which is to ignore the person or to lash out at the person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, when you start to reflect on uh, that, uh, you start to find yourself uh, maybe uh, uh, putting convenience or, or money ahead of some other things that maybe you should have done. Um, the other thing is um, I keep referring to our priest, his father, but it was Father Anthony. And I should tell you that uh, how long do you think he had been a priest? Uh, I mean, I thought that was an excellent homily. Uh, how long do you think he'd been a priest? I don't know. If, if he's young or old, um, I, I really don't know. I mean, it could come. Such wisdom can definitely come from the young, too. So I really wouldn't know. How about three weeks? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. I have got to tell you, I wanted to point that out. It was Father Anthony, and uh, he, he'd been a priest for three weeks. And um, I, I told him on the way out, I said, uh, great homily, Father. I, I said, uh, you know, you set the standard, you set the bar pretty high. Um, and, uh, you know, we were going to expect that every time. And he goes, no, 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 I started with my best, and it's all downhill from here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he has a good sense of humor. But uh, yesterday, he gave the holiday. Is he young or old? Oh, no. He's uh, early, early to mid-30s. He had a, a career. He, he had a good-paying job. Oh, you know what? This kind of ties in. Um, he had a very good-paying job. I think he had a girlfriend. You know, he was kind of going in a totally different direction, and he heard the call, and he started to discern, and um, he, uh, he did a 180. Uh, if you know, going toward the married life uh, ends up being ordained, if that's a 180, um, then that's what he did. But uh, So he had had some time experiencing a career, and he decided to, um, again, become a priest. And I think that actually gave him some real good insights as to our culture. And because yesterday's homily, he did just a – Good a job. My wife and I always talk about them, you know, after Mass. And uh, 
I have real uh, <laughs> high expectations for this young man. And I have to tell you, he's the second priest that we've had there right out of seminary. Uh, a few years back, we had a young priest. Um, and he went to the military to be a chaplain, and that's why we got Father Anthony. But he was like 25 uh, when he became a priest. Excellent homilies. So I just have to, I don't know, do a shout-out for just how well some of these uh, young men are, are being prepared to come into, and, and they're really engaged in the faith. That's the thing. They just seem to be on fire with the faith, and it shows, and it just comes through in everything they do. Yeah, yeah. You're making some, you're saying some really excellent things that um, has me thinking, you know, it's really when things are the worst, and things are really, I don't know if they're the absolute worst, but oh my goodness, if they're not, they're pretty close with the state of the church, the state of a society, the state of the culture, the state of the whole world is really very, very dismal at this point, so dismal. And yet you see these wonderful, beautiful, exquisite things coming out, people um, yeah. The book, um, all kinds of stuff, and it's in religious. And look, I really don't think these priests would be so on fire and so deep. It's less likely. It's less likely that they would be if things were actually pretty calm and serene in the church. Because, you know, if things are pretty calm and serene, there have been times when people have entered religious life because it was an easier life. Now it's not an easier life. Now it's fraught with so much friction, so much, so many difficulties. I mean, really severe cases. You know, it's it's like you don't even you just trying to figure out what's moral and what's not because everything is such a mess. And I, obviously, some things are very easy. What's moral and what's not? But how do you fix certain things? How do you? I mean, just the state of marriage nowadays. Oh my goodness gracious! The annulments, all that thing is such so complicated. It's like. I don't know, just, you know, it's like, you know, it's just so difficult. So many things are so complicated and so difficult. And when people do become, when men do become priests, when women become religious, I think it's really such a, it has to be nowadays a much deeper, much stronger conviction. So that when they do become, they are able to, to to speak uh, to to give such homilies to really have such a conviction and I think that also goes for for just us lay people I think that if you're going to stay in the church nowadays really be a part of the church and actually go to mass and really want to do what what the Catholic Church teaches you have to have a much 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 stronger deeper conviction than ever before and I think this is a good thing because. I know that for so many decades, centuries, people were religious for, um, they were religious because it was a good thing to do, because it, you were more respected. You were, I mean, all kinds of reasons, which were okay reasons, but not the, the deep reasons, not the reasons that are going to make you stay, not the reasons that are going to make you practice and develop and strive for heroic virtue. Um, there's something I just read just recently about religion. Oh, I know, I'm reading this wonderful book, um, and, uh, and it um, says, you know, there's different aspects to religion, and a part of it is the morality of it. A lot of people adhere to religion, Catholicism, Protestantism, and Mormonism is really very high on this, and um, even Jehovah's Witnesses, which is more cultish, but still, um, they adhere to a moral principle and Judaism. And, and um, the moral principles of do good, don't lie, all these things, not, whether or not each individual actually does that, that is what they're striving for. But that's just basic morality. That's really not a higher level, a spiritual level. So people can be part of a religion just to be a better person or just to be around people who are better people. Yeah, boy, you uh, you had a lot there, and I agree with it. I, I think you made some excellent points. And um, but uh, yes, today's uh, if you enter the priesthood, I think you are uh, in for a lot of work. It's not going to be easy. Uh, you are, matter of fact, it reminded me of uh, when I was much younger. I think it was in the '60s. The Marines had a slogan. Um, uh, it was. Uh, 
long hours, hard work, low pay, satisfaction guaranteed. Um, and I think that slogan could apply in some ways to our priest today. You're going to have long hours. It's going to be hard work. And, you know, priests don't get rich. They get a, they get very little. And, uh, and they enter the, uh, they become more, they become priests, I think, for that reason. And, um, and I think what you see in that person is what you were referring to, that deeper faith, that deeper commitment. So when times are tough, um, and it's not easy to be a particular, to have a certain title in our society, then uh, that's when you get the best people because who else would show up, you know? Uh, not the slack. Exactly. You're, you're going to get the best people. Um, I love that, yeah. Yeah, I love what you said about the Marine slogan. I think that's just perfect, <laughs> and that really is a slogan. And actually, the Marines have some really excellent things. Um, they also have their motto, right, Semper Fi? Or yeah. I don't know how they yeah. pronounce it. Is it Semper Fi yeah. or Semper Fi? But I think Fi, right, yeah. Yeah, um, and I mean, yeah. always faithful, and that's really that. I mean, these slogans, this model, and the slogan is really very much what Christianity should definitely be about: long hours, hard work, low pay, satisfaction guaranteed, guaranteed. reward, yeah. heaven guaranteed. If you true, if you persevere, heaven is guaranteed. The more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. God cannot be, will not be, is not outdone. And generosity. You give God a little bit of yourself, he will be generous with you. You give God a lot of yourself, he will be overflowingly generous with you. Yeah, and um, matter of fact, uh, uh, when we were talking, uh, or my comments about, you know, showing mercy is not cost-effective or efficient and all of that, um, I started thinking about that a little bit, uh, and just some quick knee-jerk comment. Um, I, I don't think we do that. Uh, uh, what we do in society is, is, yeah, when new products come to market, we always look at the cost. You know, we look at the convenience uh, and the efficiency. But uh, I think the one thing we don't do, and maybe we used to do it, when I say we, Mayor, I'm talking to people centuries ago, but do we ever consider the impact on morality? Uh, I, I don't think so so much these days. Uh, for example, does having everything in an instant uh, make us more impatient, leading to increases in domestic violence, uh, road rage, workplace violence? So um, I think when we look at this, these devices that we have, we look at can the average person afford it? Yeah, will it make life more efficient? Yeah, depending on your definition. Convenient? Yes, depending on your definition. But uh, does anyone say, okay, um, what's some downsides? Those are the upsides. What's the downside? And uh, I actually think when you look at the cost to society uh, when it comes to lack of mercy, uh, and maybe the um, we're a more hostile society. Uh, does that ever get considered when we go about our you know business in the in the world of uh, in our uh, culture uh, in the business world? Uh, what do you think? Well, I'm really not quite sure what you were saying. Are you saying that? Okay, let me see if I can, if I got, got what you're saying. Is having things be better in a way, like technologically wise, things are quicker, things are easier. Does that make us more impatient when things do go wrong? Is that what you were saying, basically? No, uh, I'm just saying. Does the average person become more patient? Uh, it's kind of an evolution thing. Uh, for example, um, not having a remote. Uh, I can remember when we only got a few channels on our TV. I can remember when we didn't have one. And then when we did, we only got a few channels, and uh, there was no remote, no such thing. Uh, now everything comes with a remote, even a window air conditioner. Uh, you, you know, uh, so people that are young and are, you know, born into this, they is their threshold for patience less than someone that's much older and sees this as these are all just conveniences and they've somewhere developed 
patience, whereas maybe the younger, much younger person, their patient level is much lower just because they think everything should happen in an instant. And when new products come on the market, is there a group anywhere in the company thinking, okay, knowing human nature, uh, what do you think this is going to do with respect to other aspects of our society? And I mentioned domestic violence, road rage, um, you know, workplace violence. Uh, do you think there's any connection there? That's kind of my – hopefully I did a better job of explaining it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, actually the thoughts that I got, I'm not sure if it's all these things that are causing young people to be more impatient. I think that perhaps it's really having less respect for life and for older people, who older people are slower. I mean, I'm not talking about okay. what – I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you okay. So in, remove the word patience. Let's use your your uh, term. Let's use your what you were saying. So do all these things cause that to happen, which has a cost, a, a morality cost? So I, I pick patience just because you know we're all familiar with road rage and things like that. We hear about it or actually experience it. But using your example, um, do you think that uh, today when companies um, think through products. Uh, do you think uh, what impact it's going to have on morality? Do you think that comes into play? Do I think companies um, think about the morality it's going to have on people? Yeah. What, what no. this could. Yeah. I don't think companies care. I don't think that's their focus whatsoever. I don't think that the average company, and I do think that there are some companies that do care, but those would be those would be few, much much fewer, and probably the smaller ones, not necessarily. But I think that most companies have absolutely don't care whatsoever about morality. They care about money, and they do care about being respectable, only because. If they're not, then uh, people won't buy their products. But they don't care about being respectable because it's the right thing. They care about it, again, because people will buy their products. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in other words, most companies don't have a vice president of morality. Uh, they don't have that department. They've got sales They marketing. don't care at all, most companies. <laughs> they don't care at all, no. I think yeah. that, that, that's what it, I mean, that's basically what a company is in our modern time. And I think right. that in, in past times, you, I think that there were, that was probably less in past times, probably. But then you had people who, you know, the usury, you had people lending, you know, and, and, and cheating people. Um, you, had, you had a lot of people in power who really took advantage. I mean, you had, I don't know. I really don't know if it really was any better in the olden times. I really don't know. There could have been some situations. I mean, you had... Um, rich people who had so you know the the uh, the what was it, the fiefdoms and all that they just had so many people working for them that were paid so little you know basically just to subsist and they were making tons of money so I don't really know I I really think that to um, have a company where it's moral you really have to uh, not always I mean there was a, a, an emperor a Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius he really tried to be very very moral. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there were, there were some, you, so, but basically, no, I think basically companies are there to make money and they're going to do whatever they can. Okay. Well, then another way to look at it is maybe is it time because you said earlier that things are not in a great, in a great place, you know, the church, the world, would it maybe be time to start adding a morality department, uh, you know? Um, what do you think? That's a new and exciting idea. You think that would fly? I don't know because <laughs> because what are you going to say is moral nowadays? I mean, it's moral to. I mean, you really, you know, it's like where is morality nowadays? We've lost sight of, you know. I don't know. I yeah. don't know if that would. Be. But we don't. Yeah, we that, have just about. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, that's the same dead end I ran into. See, when you have so many gods out there, uh, then morality is a free-flowing thing. Uh, when you have only one god, um, then it's far more precise. Uh, for example, let's say you had 100 people, and they all believed at a very high level in God. I think morality 
uh, that culture, that society would probably have far fewer uh, needs, far fewer discussions about what's right and what's wrong. I think it would be uh, pretty easy to know. Let's say then that society was 50-50, 50 people with, with a deep faith and 50 people lukewarm at best. So now things would start to, uh, you know, uh, it'd be a little harder to define things and there'd be far more discussions about what's right or wrong. Now let's go to the other far extreme, um, uh, 50 people with deep faith and 50 people who think that's all nonsense. I mean, they're not even lukewarm. They think it's a waste of time and nonsense. That's where I think you get the divergence. And that's why it's so hard to have a morality department because, What's moral? Um, it, there are so many different versions of it that it's, uh, you can't pin it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time today, so um, we'll just have to wrap up, and um, we will join everybody again on next Monday. Okay, well, let's close with our prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. It was great talking with you again, Dave, and look forward to next week. Absolutely. Thank you, Maria. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. God bless everybody. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.